This is Dr. Gilchrist uh, talking a little bit about the motor system. Now you'll kind of notice that if you're paying attention to my screen that I have actually ended up pulling up the Lecture 21 slides. Uh, this is kind of towards the back half. I might go over this again a little bit on Wednesday in class, but when I pulled up the Lecture 22 slides, it felt like it kind of popped up in the middle of nowhere. So I feel like I might need to orient you a little bit to some of the basics about how muscles work. So one of the first things that you need to know, we're going to start by talking about skeletal muscles. And skeletal muscles are, by and large, voluntary movements. Um, and so these voluntary movements um, are typically made up of the combination of a, um, a motor unit. So a motor unit is basically made up of a single alpha motor neuron. So let's be really clear. Every single motor, neur motor unit only has a single motor neuron. And then it also has what we call extrafusal fibers. And so you can kind of see that every single skeletal muscle is made up of these little motor units. So you can kind of see we've got our motor neuron right here. And then you can actually see our extrafusal fibers. They tend to be on the outside, and oftentimes our muscles are actually made up of several bundles of them. Now, just on the inside, in the belly of the muscle uh, motor unit and the muscle itself, is what we call a muscle spindle. So this is a proprioceptor. It's basically designed to help uh, help with our understanding of tension in the muscle, of stretch in the muscle. And it's basically made up of this group of smaller intrafusal fibers that are buried inside of this muscle, um, along with the sensory neuron. So this helps us figure out things like uh, tension and particularly stretch. The muscle spindles are specifically designed for looking at things like muscle length, as well as muscle tension and stretch. Um, so one of the things that's kind of interesting is that you do have what is called a neuromuscular junction here. So previously in other um, sections of the sensory systems that we've talked about, we spend a lot of time talking about neurons making connections to other neurons. Now, this is a little bit different. Here we're actually dealing with the connection between a motor neuron and a particular muscle. And this is what is called a neuromuscular junction. And so what you can actually see are, um, are um, again, we do have a synapse, we do have synaptic vesicles, and neurotransmitters are actually going to be released into the synaptic cleft. By and large, this uh, neurotransmitter will be acetylcholine, which is often very critical for um, muscle contraction. Um, you can kind of see that another way of kind of thinking about um, our postsynaptic membrane of our muscle, we sometimes call that a motor end plate. And so when a motor neuron fires and it actually makes contact with the muscle membrane, um, we basically call that an end plate potential. It's basically an excitatory postsynaptic potential of the muscle membrane. So how do these muscles contract? So basically what happens is that um, when you have that in-plate potential, uh, calcium ends up being released. And you can actually see this here. Um, so you'll notice that on the inside of these uh, muscle fibers, we actually have what is called a myofibril. Myofibril is made up of a combination of actin filaments and myosin filaments. And so what ends up happening when this muscle contracts is calcium is released. That causes our myosin to actually move and row, almost like an oar, across those different sections of actin. So generally what we're going to find is that the more intense the contraction, um, the more intense the contraction, the deeper the contraction, the more acetylcholine that is released, as such, that leads to more calcium influx, which leads to greater pulling of myosin along the actin, um, which creates a stronger contraction. So you can actually kind of see this here. If you were contracting a muscle to pull up a heavy weight, here is what your muscle filaments are doing. And you'll also notice that there is an increase in calcium uh, influx that allows that actin to row. 
thus creating a stronger contraction. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, some of the different motor tracts. Now, in particular, one uh, tract that I think is probably a little bit worth knowing um, are these dorsolateral tracts, which I'm kind of circling up here. Uh, by and large, these dorsolateral tracts that are kind of on the upper portion of the cortex and towards the outside, um, they are largely responsible for the muscles of the hands as well as the fingers. Um, these are what are referred to as lateral motor tracts. They're, they tend to occur on the outside of the cortex rather than on the inside. There are three different tracts from uh, the primary motor cortex. And remember that unlike the other primary areas that we've been talking about, the primary motor cortex is the first place that muscles, uh, that the brain actually starts planning to, um, it's kind of the last place that information goes to before those muscles move, as opposed to uh, being the first. Now, what you'll kind of notice with these lateral motor tracts is that they all do eventually cross over at relevant areas. So you'll kind of see that some of them start to cross over in the midbrain, some of them start to cross over in the pons, um, but eventually they do actually end up connecting to uh, the lateral corticospinal, um, so our lateral corticospinal tract, which is for the hands and the fingers. Um, that eventually these will end up going to regions of the spinal cord to control these particular parts of the body. So for example, our lumbar spinal cord is for our trunk and our upper legs and our feet. Our cervical spine is for our arms and our fingers and our hands and so on. So these are largely important for independent movements. Um, they are for moving the hands, the fingers, the toes, the limbs, the face. These are very, very sophisticated, complicated movements. So we officially uh, do occasionally refer to these as smart tracks. Now, on the other hand, we have our medial motor tracks. These tend to start at the brain stem and they kind of move to the muscles. And unlike our lateral motor tracks, these do not cross over to the contralateral side of the body. These are largely coordinated movements. They include uh, the movements of the, le the neck, the trunk, the legs, the fingers, the toes, the limbs, and the face. Um, but by and large, they are for reflexive movements um, to help maintain things like posture, balance, uh, locomotion, things that don't really involve a lot of sophisticated movement. So think about when you bend your knee to walk. It's not a very sophisticated movement compared to moving your tongue in your mouth to help produce words. So for this reason, we occasionally refer to these as dumb tracks. So now that you have this, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about these spinal reflexes. So although the skeletal muscles are generally under conscious control, there are some reflex loops that are contained in the spinal cord that are involuntary. Or bleh, involuntary. I don't know where I came up with involuntary. Um, one of the things that's really important to note here, these occur independently of the brain. Um, you do not necessarily need a working motor cortex or even a working connection to the brain. You could be comatose and you would still potentially produce these reflexes. So the sensory receptors, uh, like the proprioceptors um, in the muscle spindle, actually help facilitate reflexes. So just as a reminder, a muscle spindle is a group of these intrafusal fibers buried within the muscle um, and then a sensory neuron with it. So for an example, we have the patellar tendon stretch reflex. Um, so this is just one synapse that's involved. It's basically a connection between the sensory neuron embedded in the, uh, in the muscle spindle and then an alpha motor neuron. So this is one synapse. There's only one synapse here. It's a pretty quick reflex. So basically, when you lengthen your muscle, a muscle spindle is stretched. And the sensory receptor dendrites have stretch sensitive ion channels like a lot of the other mechanoreceptors that we've discussed or will discuss. Um, so ions like sodium will flow into the sensory neuron. That'll produce an EPSP. It'll send an action potential to the, the spinal cord. 
the sensory neuron will fire an action potential. Glutamate will, will be released on an alpha motor neuron in the spinal cord that will fire an action potential, thus releasing uh, acetylcholine onto the muscle and actually causing a contraction in the quadriceps muscle. Um, something kind of interesting, part of the reason that the patellar tendon stretch reflex is so popular is because it became a very common way to screen and test for polio. Um, polio is associated with motor neuron damage due to viruses, and it typically tends to affect the muscles of the leg. And so this is a very quick and easy way that one could test to determine whether or not one had polio. So let's talk about a lot of the different complex connections between the multiple areas that send input to the motor cortex. So in order to move our muscles in the most logical way, we need to actually make, um, we need to integrate a lot of different information like visual information and spatial information and use that to basically make a plan of action. Then once we make that plan of action, that information is sent to the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor area until finally going to the primary motor cortex, the last place in the cortex that you go to before the muscles move. So if you are playing something like basketball, you're incorporating a lot of information about your space, uh, the visual space, position, um, in order to know what muscles you need to move and what order. So being able to move your body is very much a multi-sensory experience. So let's talk a little bit about some of these, um, these secondary motor areas or these motor, motor associate cortices. So the primary motor cortex, like I said, is the last place in the brain that motor information goes before directly sending input to the muscles and making them move. So what about these other areas? Um, so first we have the supplementary motor area. You can actually see that right here. It tends to be more dorsal to the premotor cortex. Um, it is active during a uh, performance of learned sequences. FMRI has actually shown activity during performing learned sequences, and it typically does tend to be guided um, by the memory of the sequence. Additionally, transcranial magnetic stimulation can actually disrupt one's ability to actually perform that sequence. The premotor cortex is a little bit different. The premotor cortex is often active during uh, the viewing of motor actions that are being informed, um, performed. It's very important for following commands based on visual cues. So when you see a red light, move your hand to the right and so on. Um, one of the areas, one of the things that's kind of interesting about premotor, the premotor cortex is that um, you have mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are basically um, neurons that specifically Respond to individuals performing an action or actually watching other people perform that exact same action. So they're active when I'm talking, um, they're active when I watch somebody talking. If I walk, they're active. If I watch someone else walk, they're still active. And it's been suggested that this can provide a mechanism for understanding, imit imitation learning, and stimulating other people's behavior. So this is a little bit before your time, but there was a really cool show uh, about 10 years ago um, when I was in graduate school called Heroes. And um, there was one character in the second season named Monica who had a copycat power. She could actually watch somebody on TV and then perform that action herself. So you can kind of think like um, as your motor neurons as their own special copycat. So another area that seems to be really important include uh, the basal ganglia. So that includes different areas like uh, the caudate nucleus, which you see right here, the globus pallidus, which is right here, this area in darker blue, uh, the um, putamen, which is right behind that globus pallidus, and uh, the subthalamic nuclei, which are right here in green. And generally, these are buried under cortex. Now, why are they necessary? Um, the subcortical nuclei, these are all involved in aspects with motor control. Um, generally, they provide excitatory and inhibitory effects on movement. They can actually modify the power of contractions and damage to these areas can produce things like tremor, freezing, um, but not paralysis, as well as apoptosis, 
which is an unnatural rising of muscles. 